Hello and welcome. Richard Schneeman here. We are going to have a brief introduction into the Rails asset pipeline. So the, it's a pipeline full of assets. Um, what exactly is an asset? So um, I looked this up in the, in the dictionary. It is a useful or valuable thing, person, or quality. Inside of Rails and the web programming world, we call assets, um, We, you know, these are things where they're not they might be person, people or qualities, but more specifically, they are going to be images, JavaScript files, and CSS files. So when you hear me talk about assets, those are the three general things that I'm going to be talking about. So where do we put our assets is kind of the, the very important question that everybody is so worried about. Well... Um, we're going to put them in app slash assets. So if you're familiar with other programming languages or frameworks such as PHP, maybe ASP.NET, some of those, um, most of them we are going to put in our public folder. Uh, so we're going to have like a public slash images folder for our images, a public slash JavaScript folder for our JavaScripts. And um, this is important because in anything that goes in that public folder is, well, it's, you know, it's public. Um, and this is, can, you know, very important so people can actually view and use those images, but, uh, it, it's not so great if maybe, hey, you are working on a new version of your logo or a new version of your website and, you know, you just have it in that assets folder. Well, people can, or sorry, you have it in your public folder. People can still get to that. It's not, it's not protected. Uh, in addition to that, it's they're just raw, plain files. They're just you know kind of these dumb, boring files that just sit there. Well, um, if we let Ruby and Rails be aware of these assets, then we can do things with them. So uh, we're going to put our assets in app slash assets slash JavaScripts, images, and style sheets. Um, so the the public folder is for public things. Uh, you can certainly put images and JavaScript files and CSS files in them, but um, Rails is kind of pushing us towards this concept of using the asset pipeline instead. Uh, so when you run your app, it is going to take those uh, assets and it is going to put them into your public assets uh, folder, mostly. Uh, but it can it can also do some extra extra things that help us out quite a bit. So what are those extra things? Um, well, and this is just an example. So whenever you start off with a new Rails app, you're going to have a Rails.png that comes with it, and it's going to be available at the asset slash Rails.png path, and you can check in your own project and make or one of your previous projects and see indeed that is in the slash app slash assets slash images folder and not in your public folder. Um, so you know, previously we talked about why not putting it just in the public folder directly uh, and you know quick recap we can do some things with it that we're going to talk about in just a second we also might have some sensitive um, sensitive assets that we don't want released just quite yet and we have control over uh, what our users are going to see so um, the benefit of using the asset pipeline is we can mini file minify compile and fingerprint our files so what are those things let's let's take a look First, one, we're going to be talking about minifying. Uh, when we talk about minifying a file, we are going to remove all, all the white space. So that's going to be the new lines. That's going to be the spaces. We're going to remove all of the comments. You know, you might be like, oh, hey, I'm doing this, like, the stupid hack because I don't, you know, have time to finish it or something. You don't necessarily want those comments in your, in the final production version of your application, but we want those in... You know, you want those as you're you're working on it. It makes it, it makes it easier, and we can also change variable names to make them shorter, make them simpler. Uh, so this is an example of a JavaScript minifier. So on the top, um, I've actually got all of jQuery, and it's it's much more than you can see here. This is just all that would fit in the screenshot. So I've got a bunch of uh, jQuery in the top. And in the bottom, um, it, it has minified it. So you can see we have no white space. We've got no uh, comments and all of that's actually, I believe, on one line, uh, and it it gives us the ratio. So it actually reduced the size of this JavaScript by forty seven percent. So 
you know, that's that's pretty impressive. Like, I don't care how small your JavaScript file is, if you can compress it even further, if you can compress it by 47%, then as you are serving your JavaScript file over the, over the wire, and, you know, this is important, if you have a one megabyte JavaScript file, then that means every single time a new person comes to your site, they're going to have to download an entire megabyte of JavaScript. Um, and if you um, happen to grow up in the days of dial-up modem, like, you're like, wow, you know, a whole megabyte, like, that'll, that'll take, like, you know, that'll take, like, 20 minutes. Well, you know, luckily, we have super fast internet connections, and it's not as big of a deal. But even so, half a megabyte of a file is going to take half as long. It doesn't matter how fast you're doing it, it's going to still be um, twice as fast. So uh, minifying is a really good thing, and luckily for us, um, our, uh, we, you know, we can leverage the asset pipeline to minify things for us. So pretty neat. Um, in the, in the past, you can still go ahead and you can still minify files. You can, uh, you, you, it would just be a very manual process. So you would minify it yourself and you would put it in the public folder. But with this, we can have Rails, again, manage that for us. Like why should we have to do that when Rails can do it? All right. The next thing that Rails can do, and this is, this is probably one of my favorite, um, or just one of the coolest, is it can compile things. And you're like, compile things? What does that mean? Let's take a look at some SCSS. So here we can see SCSS on the top, and it compiles to CSS. You might say, hey, why do we want to do that? Well, it, it turns out that CSS is pretty um, keen on being backwards compatible. So if you write CSS now, it might we might be able to do some you know really cool things, but we can't necessarily always use those uh, you know, back uh, quite some time. So if we were to add some new conventions to CSS, like variables or, or some other things, then they wouldn't, we wouldn't be really be able to use them inside of uh, our modern, um, our modern frameworks for a, a few years, just because it takes so f long for people to update their browsers. There are still people using IE6. IE6 came out over 10 years ago. Um, even Microsoft wants you to quit using it. So, uh, up in the CSS, we have we're defining a variable, which is really cool. It'd be great if we could use variables in CSS, but we can't. So uh, to get around this, we can use SCSS, which has support for variables. So we're defining our color of blue, and then we're later using our color of blue, and we're saying, hey, we want you to darken that by nine percent. So not only can we have variables, we can have functions inside of SCSS, and we can, when we compile that, it's going to compile down to completely human readable CSS. So uh, the result of a blue, which is uh, 3BBFCE hex code, um, by darkened by 9% is going to be 2B9EAB. And almost all browser, well, all browsers can understand that unless you're running like, I don't know, like IE1 or something. So uh, using SCSS is a way that we can make the the process of writing our CSS easier, and then it actually generates just plain old CSS that anyone can understand. Uh, now, you can use this outside of Rails. There are some projects um, where you can just write in SCSS and generate that CSS if you're excited and you haven't seen this before. Definitely go check those out, um, and it, it's great that with Rails we kind of just get this uh, functionality mostly out of the box. We can, in addition to compiling SCSS, we can compile SAS. So SAS is like SCSS, but it's got significant white space. So rather than all those curly brackets, we use indentation. So here we are saying that inside of our content navigation class, so dot content uh, dash navigation, we want it to have a border color of blue. And rather than using curly brackets, we indent border color of blue uh, in under content navigation as well as uh, color darken. If that kind of scares you, if you're like, whoa, 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 you know, I, I like those curly brackets, uh, the more you see this, the more you get used to it. And at this point in time, I would definitely, if, if I had the option of, you know, completely starting over, complete uh, new project, then, uh, you know, SAS to me looks cleaner. It looks it looks better. It actually shaves off a, a line of um, of code having that curly bracket at the bottom, and it just means less normally less syntax errors. Um, it also enforces good habits. So generally, it's a good habit to keep your indentation consistent, and this makes sure your indentation is consistent. So that's why I like SAS. But um, a lot of people, if they're just getting started off, SAS looks a little too foreign. And with SCSS, we can actually, if you already have existing CSS, um, SCSS is, well, it is just 
CSS, but with additional things. So you can copy and paste that CSS into your SCSS. Whew, that's like a tongue twister. All right. Uh, so moving on, we've talked about compiling things to CSS. Let's compile something. Well, the, they actually don't like using the word compile, but let's uh, make turn something into JavaScript. So here on the top, we have copy script. So we've got an array of foods, and then we are going to say eat food for food in foods where food isn't chocolate. And uh, the result of that, that's actually going to compile compile or, or uh, generate some JavaScript that looks kind of like this. It's going to, you know, here we have a, a an array, so the, the array is not too terribly different. But then we have our, um, our loop, and, you know, it's quite a bit more verbose, quite a bit more curly brackets, and, you know, I personally prefer CoffeeScript, uh, the, or the syntax of the coffee, CoffeeScript over JavaScript. Uh, so some people get kind of excited about this. Some people get kind of confused by this. So at at its at its heart, whenever you are actually sending over data over the wire, you are just sending over CSS. You are sending over JavaScript. You are not sending over SCSS. You are not sending over um, CoffeeScript. Um, we are going to turn these things into JavaScript, which everybody can understand and then send it over the wire or we're going to turn it into CSS and then send it over the wire and then the browser whenever somebody visits your website they're not going to get coffee script they're just going to get JavaScript um, another question I get asked is you know should I learn I don't know JavaScript and I don't know coffee script should I should I just jump ahead and learn coffee script is it going to be confusing so in uh, I haven't played a lot, uh, spent a lot of time playing with CoffeeScript. I've heard really good things, though. I know a lot of very smart people who have used it in some big projects, and they they wouldn't ever go back. Um, personally, I think everyone should know a little bit of JavaScript. You know, just uh, and that's why in the exercise we're going to be doing, we are going to be using some JavaScript. But if you play with JavaScript a little bit, and then you play with CoffeeScript a little bit, and you say, okay, you know, forget it, I just want to write CoffeeScript, then uh, feel free by all means. One, one, I guess, kind of shortcoming or thing I don't 100% love about CoffeeScript is since browsers don't understand CoffeeScript, if we are using the console, like our JavaScript console, like we did in the JavaScript video, then we can't just paste in CoffeeScript directly. We have to compile it to JavaScript first and then, and then paste that into our console um, if you are debugging things. So uh, that might be something to consider. All right, the last thing that the asset pipeline can do, and uh, well, you know, I said the compiling might be my favorite just in terms of like that's really, really neat. Fingerprinting is probably actually the most useful. Um, well, you'll see. So uh, when we talk about hashing a file, it's like taking its fingerprint. Now, this um, people sometimes get confused. We've been talking about uh, hashes, and we, this is not the hash data type. This is a hashing function, or you might hear me call it a cryptographic hash. So one example of that type of a hash is MD5. MD5 is an you know an open source algorithm, and we use it to fingerprint a file. So it doesn't matter how big the file is; it's always going to return a fingerprint of the same length. Just like you know. It, it doesn't matter how big a person is; we're, they're still going to have these, you know, fingerprints on their on their fingers. So, um, we would call MD5 a hashing function. Um, and again, a hashing function is not a Ruby hash. These are these are two different things. It's not a dictionary. And you will, the, it's maybe a little bit subtle for you, but whenever I refer to a hashing. Function, I will call it that, a hashing function. Whenever I talk about a Ruby hash, I will call it just purely a hash. Um, so let's keep on going. You know, if we run MD5 on a CSS file, then you know maybe we run it on headers.css. We are going to get a fingerprint like this. It's gonna you know nine zero eight e two five you know whatever whatever whatever. And as long as that CSS file doesn't change, it is whenever we run MD5 on it, it is always going to produce the same fingerprint every single time, guaranteed. Now, if we were to modify the headers file just a little bit, maybe, you know, we changed the background color to red, maybe we did some other things, we saved it to disk. Uh, when we run our MD5 on it, the fingerprint is going to change. I don't care if you just added one space, if you just added one period, 
whatever, the uh, MD5 will change. So that is that is kind of why we call it a fingerprint. If it's if it's you know if it's a different person, then it's a different fingerprint. And in this case, if it's a different file, the file if the file's contents have changed, then it is a different file. So the fingerprint is going to change. It might be, have the same name, but um, at it at its heart, the contents are not the same as it was previously. Uh, so in essence, when a file changes, so does the fingerprint. Uh, we can add the fingerprint to a file like this. We take the fingerprint and then we just add it instead of headers.css, we have headers dash and then the fingerprint and then .css. You might be saying, well, okay, all right, you said this was really useful and I understand so far I'm following. We take MD5 of the contents of headers.css. We add that, you know, we generate a fingerprint. We add that fingerprint to the file name. Okay. All you've really done is make longer file names. So the the neat, really neat thing about this is if you change the contents of headers.css, the file name will also change. And you're still probably like, okay, that's cool, I guess, but how do we use that? Or why would we want that? So whenever you send over data from your server to a client, say Chrome, they are going to cache it. So uh, whenever you send over jQuery, it's going to say, oh, hey, thanks for sending me over jQuery. Uh, I'm going to just hold on to this, like, megabyte file or however big it is. And next time I see on your website that you are telling me I need this, well, hey, I don't have to re-download it because, you know, downloading things is slow. The, inter the network connections are slow. Disk access, by comparison, is tremendously, tremendously faster. So we, you know, we can just use that. Browsers are going to try to hold on to things for a while. Um, well, you know, if we if we tell them to, and it's good if we tell them to. It's good if we say, hey, hold on to this as long as as possible because I don't want to have to keep on using up my bandwidth from my server and sending my JavaScript file. So um, we can actually just go ahead and rather than saying header, you know, sending headers.css and having it download headers.css every single time to have to see if it's different. Well, it will download headers.css dash the fingerprint name dot or headers dash the fingerprint name dot CSS. And it is going to keep that in cache forever for as long as it possibly can. And then if you modify that file, if you change it, it's going to actually be a different file name. And even though to us headers dash one, two, three looks uh, the same as headers dash five six seven dot css. The computer doesn't. It can it sees those as two completely different browser name or two completely different file names. And so when you give it a different uh, fingerprint, it's going to re-download that file. Uh, this might sound really trivial, but if you have ever you know done any production work with um, with assets, then you know you'll you probably run across this problem where you update something on the server and then you go and you, you're refreshing and it's not showing up and then you realize, oh, it's cached in your browser but not in new browsers and then, you know, some browsers work, some don't and, you know, it's kind of this big pain. In addition to that, we can also uh, leverage CDNs with this, uh, with this capability. So some CDNs or content distribution networks that we haven't talked about quite yet, but like, uh, like CloudFront are capable of acting in a similar fashion and, and caching these files. And so whenever we change the file names, then we are going to actually tell it, hey, this is a completely different file. And um, fingerprinting in the asset pipeline is what gives us that capability. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about in the asset pipeline section is the difference between um, development and production. So when you are developing, then or on um, your development environment, then you're going to compile on every single request versus in production, you're only going to compile once at deploy. If you're using Heroku, we're actually going to run a task called rake assets precompile that is uh, given to us via Rails. Whenever we are in development mode, Minify is off. So generally, you want to be able to read your JavaScript. If you get a JavaScript error, it'll actually show up inside of that console. It's very convenient to debug. In production, Minify is on because we want to keep those files as small as possible. In development, um, fingerprinting is going to be off 
uh, just because it takes a little bit of extra time. And in production, fingerprinting is going to be on. So uh, you you know you might have a little bit of a discrepancy between development and production. You know maybe you make a change and then you push it to production, and, and it doesn't look exactly like it did in development. Well, in general, that's bad. In general, that we don't want that to ever happen. But uh, just keep in mind that those are some of the some of the minor differences, and you can just go back and retrace your steps. Make sure, uh, inspect your HTML. Make sure everything that you think should be there is there, and that it's in the form that you think it should be. Check for any kind of errors and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so 